Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Robert B. Miller, MD. Dr. Robert Miller is a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist. Dr. Miller received his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine. He did his internship at Jewish Hospital Cincinnati and his residency at Eastern Virginia Medical School. Dr. Miller is board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, and Dr. Miller is on staff at the Washington Hospital Healthcare System. Uh, this talk will be focused on non-surgical non type care in the first part of it, and Dr. Multani will follow up with surgical issues related to the lower back, okay? And uh, <clears throat> the presentation will be initially a little bit toward the initial cervical spine, and then the last part will be to the lower back, which is a predominant problem with lower back pain. But by a raise of hands, I'm curious, who knows what a physiatrist is? One, two, three. Four. The reason why I bring that up is no one seems to know what a physiatrist is. So I'll give you an easy definition for most of you that don't know. Anyway, a physiatrist is someone who does everything a neurosurgeon does or an orthopedic surgeon does except operate. We're the conservative care people. The most recent example of a physiatrist that you may have heard about or a team of physiatrists was on the Congressman Gabrielle Gifford after she had her gunshot wound. It was the physiatrist that rehabilitated her back to health. So that's a good example. Christopher Reeve was under the care of a physiatrist. So there's a lot of different uh, avenues that we're involved with besides lower back pain. So moving on here, I'm going to assume I can do this. Perfect. Uh, I want you to think about this talk from my perspective as I go through here. Common sense approaches how we deal with back pain or neck pain. Okay. Uh, so an example is like with the neck. You can have shoulder pain present into the neck. You can have neck pain present into the shoulder. It's not always easy to figure out. And the patterns are always the key to figuring out a little about where the etiology of the pain is coming from. We also look at mechanisms of injury, signs, and some provocative techniques or maneuvers that we do on the patient. I want to also emphasize the other part about the anatomy. Just about every part in your neck or lower back is innervated. So it's not just nerves. There's ligaments, there's bones, there's tendons, there's discs. So that's the take home message I want you to take home. Uh, as far as muscles, we can treat those with sometimes that are ones that are aggravated, especially the deep muscles in the neck or lower back with trigger points. The other thing to understand is you can have what I call uh, red flags that may throw, off, throw you off of what's going on. So for example, you can have uh, GI upset stomach can sometimes refer to the lower back. Or you can have sometimes issues with the liver causing some neck or shoulder pain, things like that. So it's not just a simple diagnosis. I threw this slide up because sometimes I know when people are in back pain, this is what they feel like. They're getting yelled at because the pain is so intense and they want to know what's going on. Two messages I want to take home here for the entire talk is that the body, neck, or lower back didn't read the textbook. I have learned that from dealing with patients for over 15 years now, and that's very important. The other part of it is, Dr. Miller, I read this on the internet, and they talk about this and this, and this is what I think I got. Well, the internet didn't go to medical school, residency, fellowship, and have experience. So I want to keep that in a little context. A little side story is the fact that I had a patient say, I definitely have piriformis syndrome. I definitely have it. And yet when I did the exam and the history, Turned out he had a left L5 radiculopathy with a confirmed herniated disc based on exam. 
So that takes home the message where I want you to understand that it has to be a little experience blended in there. Okay, structures, again, I, I already emphasized that. I'm kind of going through this cervical part first because I'm going to get to the more anatomy in a minute. But again, some of the different structures in the neck can present from different areas, like a rotator cuff tear won't always present with a shoulder problem. I've had liver lesions where it was actually referring into the part of the base of the neck. And of course, unrelenting headaches, that's something else, possibility of even a stroke. And I, I've had one case when I was in residency, presented with neck pain, turns out they had an aneurysm. So we caught it early, so it's important. Again, historical issues are important from the history, but also we also differentiate, differentiate the pain in referred type pain outside the neck. We use the term axial pain. We're basically tasting and talking about the middle part of the neck. And of course, different other type of muscle skeletal conditions like myofascial pain, which is a deep type of pain. You've heard about fibromyalgia. I think that's overdiagnosed. That is a diagnosis of exclusion. And of course, whiplash is a common term for people that, that have been in a car accident and their necks either flex too much or extend too much. And they actually cause a lot of damage to the deeper muscles into the neck. I've broken this out. This is a basic busy slide. And the only thing I'm doing is trying to show on the left hand side, the axial plane has uh, a lot of different differentials of how it can present in the limb where it's furring out to the outside of the neck. Again, a, a wide differential. Again, mechanism of injury, we look at that possibility, what can be causing it. I think the thing that I want to take home here is cervical spinal stenosis. We're all going to get cervical spinal stenosis. All right? The thing to understand is how you function with that can be improved with conservative measures. Okay? And I'll talk about spinal stenosis in depth when we get into the lower back. Again, busy slide. I just want to emphasize, and if you want to copy this handle, we can get it to you, is the fact that it's distributed where it is in your body and where it's going. Radicular plane, just as a fancy word for saying pain being referred outside the normal axial, or in this case, the middle of the neck or the lower back. Uh, <clears throat> also, the key is to understand the referral patterns based on the dermatomes, which I won't get into that as much, but it gives us a hint of where those pains are coming from. All right. Again, upper and lower back presents with different suggestions about that. They will talk about facet pain on the lower back, but can be referred either more related to the upper back with disc degeneration or facet, you'll see more on the lower back. Great. I feel honored. I got a green poner. All right. Uh, you can also have pain between the shoulder blades. That's interscapular. A common little test that we do is to bring the neck back. If you look at me, bring a neck back, extend, laterally rotate, and then I push on the top of your head, for example. You say pain's going down your neck or you into your arm. That's a classic example of a Sperling's maneuver, and you can look at how that presents for a cervical root. Uh, again, disc or cervical root present into the forearm or hand. Red flags, okay. The, the big thing I want to take home from here is that the red flags are important because you need to understand back pain or even neck pain present with a variety of conditions that are not just neck or back. And so the hardest ones that I've had to deal with are on lower back, for example. Patient has a history of breast cancer. She's been breast cancer free for 10 years. And no one bothered to work up with an MRI of the lower back to see if the cancer came back. Turns out it did come back. They were able to catch it. It had now spread. But uh, from my vast follow-up, she was able to uh, do very well. But my point is, anytime I hear of red flags, that's always on top of my mind. Uh, again, some of the treatments are we talk about a steroid taper. I have a lot of patients that do not want me to inject their lower back, especially in the lower back, for an epidural. I respect that. It is not a medical emergency. It is prudent. So I do what's called a steroid taper. It's an oral type of aversion. And it helps with the lower back pain, especially if the nerve roots are irritated. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are really targeted toward actually treating the different local inflammations. The reason why it's harder to help with the lower back pain specifically is your circulation goes down after age 35. And it's similar to like I call it like a mini heart attack to the lower back. It doesn't get as well circulation, but it's still important to do that. The other, co other problem is that if you notice, like especially if you have a lower back strain or back pain over time, 
when you wake up in the morning, you complain about stiffness or a band-like type of pattern on your lower back. I know I can't move, so it's basically if you visualize this is on your lower back type pain. And that's because you got some chronic little spasm going on there. And that's why I like to do the muscle relaxant. Now, the reason why I add these medicines on board early is because when I do the physical therapy, I want you to tolerate the physical therapy. And it's designed under type of physiatric guidance of the targeted muscles and how they should approach it. And if you can't tolerate the therapy because you're in pain or discomfort, we're not going to have a good outcome. So always make sure you have plenty of medicines. Uh, sometimes we try cervical traction for patients that need that for neck pain that have a very bad arthritic type of neck and it does help and it sometimes avoid having to get an epidural on the neck or even possible surgery. And of course the referral to the physiatrist if we're never sure. Now this is now the second part of this now for toward the lower back. Uh, I did take to heart the uh, suggestions from the audience when I talked last time. So I tried to add a little more uh, photos here. So when you have back pain, I know you feel like this. Definitely feel it. And again, it, referring back to the back, it again, is anatomy, ligament, nerve, referral pattern, and movements can give you a clue of what's going on with the lower back. The differential, if it's definitely flexion, has to do with either muscles or ligaments predominantly. Sometimes the discs or an annular tear, and also vertebral bodies. I've appreciated more over the last couple of years osteophytes in the canal where the nerve goes through called the neural foramen. That's very important. And of course, people that have osteoporosis or osteopenia, which is a fancy word for saying early osteoporosis, can have compression fractures and that's severe pain too. Now, we, as we all get older, if you ever measured yourself in your disc, I mean your overall height, you notice you shrink. We're all gonna have that problem, okay? So it's a combination of the disc dehydrating and the actual changes. Now, this slide was, designed so that you can get a gas grasp that we start at the top. This is a good example of a good vertebral body or bone, nice disc. And as you come down, as we get older, we get this disc breakdown. We have also what's called a bulging area right here. This area here is the neural frame where the nerve root can come out. Again, more herniation would be disc herniation. This does not always mean you're going to have a clinical symptom, by the way. And then a thinning of the disc as we get older. Degeneration and osteophytes, see how these bones are not regular as compared to here? And these osteophytes can grow out into that foramen, cause tightening there. And again, osteophyte formation. This is now, I've taken that slide and I've cut it across. It's called an axial view. And to get oriented, this would be your abdomen here. This is your lower back, okay? This is the vertebral body. There's actually, don't draw it here, there's a ligament that goes vertically down. And there's also here a ligament to help with stability. And then in here is your spinal cord area over in here. This is where your nerve is coming out and eventually will come out right through here. And there's an example of a nerve coming out here. Okay? And these are just different attachment points for muscles. This is the transverse process, the spinous process. These areas here are the facet joints. We're actually one vertebras on top of another. Okay, muscles I want you to appreciate. This is a muscle that's not appreciated when it comes to lower back pain. It's called the quadratus lumborum. And most people don't know about this muscle. They think of the erecti spinal muscles, but they don't know where to check for the trigger points for this one. This muscle example would be you do a lot of repetitive lifting and bending. About a day or two later, you notice a deep achy pain, you feel like it grabs you so much you can't get out of bed. That's the common complaint I have from patients. And an example of it now, if you look at the trigger points, those are the X's here. Okay? Now you see the, where the pain goes. When you point on here, here, it's either going to be right here in the upper buttock or lower buttock or on the lateral thigh. It can refer into the groin. And you can see how it can confuse a lot of doctors. A lot of doctors, if they saw that pattern, would assume it may be a hip injury or something with the actual disc itself. And a lot of times you'll get the MRIs and it'll come up normal for the lower back and hip, and they've missed this muscle. Another example to appreciate is that we've taken this area and we've sliced it across, and now we're looking again at axial view. This is the back, this is toward the abdomen. Again, here's your paraspinals, there's your multifidus, but look, that muscle's deep. 
even behind some of the paraspinals. It's another, that's the reason why it's important to appreciate that muscle. I've treated that muscle with good myofascial release. That's a fancy word for a fancy massage to that muscle. Along with trigger points, the patient gets better. They don't need to see anyone else. So it's an underappreciated muscle. I did some color anatomy to throw everybody off. I do have color in my slides now. So to get oriented, this is a classic example of nice vertebral body. This is the disc. And of course, there's the nerve going right through here, part of the spinal cord. So that was what I wanted to throw off there. The thing I want to emphasize with the disc, when I'm talking about the disc, and people hear that a lot, I've herniated my disc, I've hurt my disc. I want to emphasize something here. It's only the outer one third of that disc that actually is innervated with any type of nerve fibers. And that wasn't appreciated until the mid 90s. And it was um, a bunch of physiatrists that figured that out. So mechanism of injury is usually a torsion injury where you're doing twisting or heavy twisting and moving your body. And that's important to understand what goes on. The biggest complaint is sitting intolerance or a deep achy pain. Here's the number one way you really figure it out if it's something to do with the disc. is something that causes your abdominal pressure to go up. The most common way is having a bowel movement, sneezing, laughing really hard. Those are the most common ways. So we call these annular tears, and that's the first probably early pathology leading to disc problems, which will eventually lead to potential disc herniation, which then can lead to problems. You can have, by the way, a annular tear without disc herniation, but because of all the local inflammation in that area, you'll actually wind up with an indirect impingement by the pressure from the inflammatory process on the nerve root, which leads to the actual uh, nerve compression. So here's an example on this slide. When you look at it in depth, it combines two things. Here's an example of an annular tear right here. All right, And this is an actual example where the tear has progressed now where the disc is now no longer here, it's protruding out. Okay? It's now affecting this nerve root where you get a little irritation with that orange there. Okay? The reason why most of the disc herniations are in the posterior lateral area is because the actual fibers that support this area or the uh, fibrous material is very thin, and that's one of the reasons why there's more common areas for herniation there. It's rare to have a herniation or annular tear up in this area here. Okay? If you're wondering what these are, these are the examples of your nerve roots coming down. They just haven't come out and progressed due to the side yet. Okay. Disc degeneration. This is something that I, I didn't appreciate until I worked with a lot of patients. And it's multiple things with your lower back anatomy. And basically it's an aging of your anatomy and not just one structure. Okay? So it's not just the disc that ages. The bones age, the ligaments age, and so an example of that is if you look at again this view here, the disc is torn a little bit but also worn, decompressed, but that this, this joint here, even though they don't show it, that will get worn called the facet joint. And then this is where I now cut across and I'm looking at this area. Again, there's that little tear I talk about. The opening where this nerve root comes out is very narrow and you don't have the nerve roots as happy when they come out. So that's what's going on there. Uh, the risk factors to the actual bones themselves, we call those the vertebral bodies, of course, are you can have osteoporosis, where now the, the actual bones can fracture from compression. The most common complaint with this or presentation, from my experience, is that the patient says, I wasn't doing anything, Dr. Miller. I just got up one day, and the back just went crazy and hurt like whatever, and the pain wouldn't let up. Uh, another example is, that's why the history is so important, I don't want to miss that red flag. I always check in their history, have they ever had any cancer, cancer treatment, or a history, a family history of cancers. And sure enough, I've you know, found a few, unfortunately, just based on back pain presentation. Uh, if it's classic, it's just vertebral body, it can get worse with flexion. Uh, usually I push the very back, remember that spinous process, that piece that just stuck out toward the back, in that earlier photo? and they can cause it to get worse. Other things you can see is, of course, I talked about the bone formation, osteophytes, and another new term called spondylolisthesis. That's a fancy word for saying slippage of one vertebral body over another, where one moves forward or backward relative to the other position. So 
One of the things we always work on is trying to really diagnose if there is a nerve root. I, I didn't show my fancy machine called an EMG machine, but I want to show conceptually what we're looking for. So to appreciate this slide, you notice here that's an artery, that's a vein, and those are little nerve endings binding to the different muscle fibers there. And when this contracts or fires, that muscle fiber is going to fire. And we're looking for abnormal patterns when we stick the pin in to look at the muscle to see if there's an abnormal pattern. And that's how we know if this nerve root is actually being irritated. In this case, all three of these are being irritated, so I would pick that up on my nerve uh, EMG exam. Another example is an irritated nerve root that means that this nerve is now, if I was to trace this all the way back, I'd come back up to here and see this red would represent the disc now is protruding, pushing on the nerve root, which causes right in here to get irritated, right in there. So that's what I'm trying to you know, look for. So we use the muscles as an indirect way to get a window into how bad the nerves are doing. It's a very, uh, and by the way, it's very highly sensitive, highly specific. It's one of the gold standards for testing for nerve irritation. Here's an actual MRI of a disc herniation. Remember, we always show the normal disc should be like this. And here it is right here, coming out. So there you go. There's that fancy word, spondylolisthesis. Now, this is a very interesting um, word in the context of when you think about this type of diagnosis. If it's a gymnastic or a young person, it usually will occur at the lower level, L5S1. If it's someone over age, age 50, 60, or someone most likely in their 70s, it'll be at actually L4, L5. And it presents as a deep, achy, low back ache, but it can also radiate pain into the buttock or even the posterior thigh. So let's give an example here. We looked at a normal vertebral body. There's your spinous process. There's your transverse process. There's your facet joint. There's your spinal canal. And there's your main body. So we're coming down here. And now all of a sudden, this has moved a little anterior relative to this one. It's pushing back a little bit. Here's another example. You see it again. This is the back. This is the front pushing forward. And this is back. And you see how the disc is now in a different position. With it. They call it a slip disc. The biggest complaint I see with this problem is stiffness in the morning when they wake up. So it's very, uh, the other thing I want to emphasize too, and Dr. Moltani may address this in more depth, when we grade these, and we grade these up to four levels, we depend on how much the percent movement is. Let's say this is 10 centimeters, for example, which it's not, but 10. If it's gone more than, let's say it's like 2.5, it's around 20, 25%. That's called a grade one. If it's gone five centimeters, that's a grade two, et cetera. So by the time it gone to a 75% or grade three, then it might be a surgical case. Because we're looking at the main reason why we're concerned about this is instability. And Dr. Moltani will address that more in her talk about instability. So, OK, so now I want to talk about osteophytes. This is something that I appreciate more as I've looked at more MRIs and dealt with patients. The, the bones, and I don't know if you ever heard this term, are dynamic. Bone is always moving and changing throughout our body in our lifetime, especially in the lower back. And this is another example where they'll have osteophytes, little bony growths in positions where they shouldn't be. So one thing to appreciate is there's actually a canal here. It's not a long canal, but it's, it's called the neural foramen. And if you can, I don't have a good picture, but here's the actual nerve root outside the canal and inside there. But you see there's a little bone growth there. Normally the canal should be this wide based on this picture. You see how tight it is there? And I've got a bone pushing into that nerve. And the classic problem is they'll present to me like they have an L5 or S1 radiculopathy, an actual pinched nerve, and we'll do some basic physical therapy first. And if it's bad enough, I'll actually do an injection. And they get better, and I don't see them for years. But we know from the anatomy, when I've checked with the radiologist, they comment on the neural frame with osteophytes. And that's what happened. We calmed down the local inflammation. So whatever space we have has now been opened up by reducing inflammation with the steroid injection. And that makes it easier for the recovery. Other examples are you can have the osteophytes here actually going into the disc area. You can see that there. And that, again, could lead to an annular tear. And that can start the progression leading to a possible disc herniation 
things like that. Also notice it can affect the joints, called the facet joints, and that's another area where it's contention. And so it's, uh, it's something I appreciate more, especially with my older patients. Now, this is an example of, I call it lower back arthritis, lumbar spinal stenosis. And the reason why this is important is I've already shown you a couple of slides where the actual openings for the nerve are tight, the actual opening of the disc or the disc height's tight, and the joints are changed. And so the body compensates. And functionally how we compensate is, here we have a patient that is sitting green, kind of happy, comfortable, doesn't mind getting up. Now she wants to go shopping. She doesn't realize it, or he realizes it. He gets up and they want to go and grab a shopping cart and they push the shopping cart. Because if we naturally flex our body forward, I can't show you perfectly, that's why I have the slide, it'll open up the neural foramen that I talked about earlier, so the disc root will not be impacted as much. Instead of being tight like that, it might go like that, okay? So a little bit of daylight. That relieves the pressure. They don't want to bend their back back. That's when they really complain about the pain. 15% uh, of mediated pain, <clears throat> specifically with the chronic lower back pain, is from the joint of the actual facet. So let's talk about that a little bit. The actual chronic lower back pain patient, by definition, is someone who has back pain for more than three months, and roughly 10 to 15% of them will have a facet problem. This is a commonly misdiagnosed problem, okay? The pain localizes specifically to the middle of the lower back, and the only way to really have a gold standard is you have to actually inject the joint itself. And I'll see if I've got a slide for that, and I do. So, let's talk about joints of the back. There's the actual joint for the lower back, and that's the area I'm talking about. It gets worn over time. Again, this is toward the abdomen. This is toward the back. There's that one ligament I told you about, the anterior longitudinal ligament. There's the posterior longitudinal ligament. Now, let's talk about a joint that's irritated. There's a facet joint, and right there it's very irritated. And the reason why this is important is because above the actual joint usually is there's innervation. So it's a two innervated joint level type of problem. And it's a it's pain that again has to be diagnostically injected to really confirm the diagnosis. Now this is a joint that I talked about earlier, I mean a, a condition I talked about earlier. This is called the piriformis syndrome. It's an underappreciated and misdiagnosed condition. Okay? Dr. Ernie Johnson, who's from Ohio State, who's the guru in our field, uh, He's had to lecture a lot of surgeons. A lot of surgeons don't believe in this diagnosis. But Dr. Johnson is a very persuasive man if you ever met him. So trust me, you don't want to question him. So anyway, it's about up to 10% of patients have this problem with the muscle. I'll show you a picture in a minute. And the key on this, it has to present almost exclusively initially on the lower buttock or mid-buttock, radiating to the posterior thigh in the lower back. And it can radiate down to the calf or foot, to the top or bottom of the foot. Now, why is that important? Because a lot of physicians are taught anything radiating to the calf or foot, top or bottom, is either a radiculopathy or a herniated disc. And they don't think about this diagnosis and they miss it. But the key is it's aggravated by prolonged hip flexion. Adduction means bring in your leg bone, or in this case your, uh, sorry, your thigh bone, your femur, across your body, and then turning it inward makes it worse. So here's an example of different types. This bone, this muscle is deep now. So think above here is your buttock, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and minimus in here. But anyway, it's deep and it connects from the trochanter over to the actual area of your pelvis. And this is normal right here. Normally, this sciatic bundle, which has the comparineal nerve and tibial nerve, comes out through and goes below. Here's an example where it can go above, but if the muscle is irritated, it will actually indirectly cause problems on the actual tibial component. Here's actually penetrating through roughly about 20%, no, 15, 20% of patients that have piriformis have this penetrating presentation based on cadaver studies. And here's where they're both going through, okay? Here's the pain pattern. Again, buttock predominantly here and see how it goes down to the posterior thigh. And there's the anatomy, how it connects up. And so when I test people, I have to put them in a special maneuver, side lying, and I'm actually poking right on these tender points right there. 
and I have to recreate their pain. And they have to show consistency, by the way, too. How to treat it? It's very good to be treated conservatively, not aggressively. Okay? Uh, so, conservative means some measured issues with muscle relaxants, NSAIDs. The key is on physical therapy. They should know how to do myofascial or muscle release to that. And this diagram was put up here for one reason. Well, Dr. Miller, they showed me how to stretch the piriformis, but I did it on a chair standing up, or I did it in some position that was very awkward and it was a lot of strain on the lower back. This is a way to actually stretch this muscle, which means they're actually moving. This is the area that's being affected. They bring it across and stretch it, and they're laying down like that, and they use the wall to climb up where they try to advance closer to the wall. And the point is there's no stress in the lower back when you do this technique. Now, if it's something where it's really a difficult type of situation where it doesn't respond but it's confirmed based on like a diagnostic injection that I've done, then I will do either a steroid injection or believe it or not, we'll actually inject with Botox under fluoroscopy. That's a fancy way for a live x-ray to make sure. But I've rarely had, I've rarely had to do this type of procedures because most of the people respond to conserved therapy. Okay. Non, other non-surgical treatments I've talked about, this is the itinerary. I've already talked about red flags a little bit, non-red flags, steroid taper, uh, muscle relaxants, etc. The thing I want to emphasize here is lumbar traction. Cervical traction is very effective. Lumbar traction is not. Okay. You'll see some chiropractors in the community advertising for a machine called a DX9000, and they claim they have wonderful results. When you actually look at the literature and look at the side effects and the outcomes, it's not effective. My recommendation, those, those procedures on that machine cost anywhere from five to $10,000 cash. I'd like you to save your money, okay? Don't use that machine. Now, the other thing that I've appreciated with people that have lumbar spinal stenosis or even other type of conditions we talked about is transforaminal epidural injections. I'll show you what that is. This is an example of it. Diagrammatically, we're actually injecting. Here's the nerve root. We're trying to inject right below there. Let me give you, that was not a clear picture. I tried to blow it up. It didn't work out very well. So, axial position. We come in from the side. We get underneath the nerve and we inject it. What we're doing is we're coating the nerve root here, because the, the actual movement of your CSF fluid comes from here and goes up toward your head. So here's an example of injected, and you'll see it coming up, tracking up along in that direction. That's a successful transforaminal injection. Another rare one is sacroiliac disease, predominantly, again, buttock pain with the lower back, but also to the thigh. It's predominant over age 50. Uh, it's, it's mainly diagnosed by, again, diagnostic injection. And there are some provocative maneuvers I can use on exam, but it's not as sensitive or specific compared to the diagnostic injection. This joint connects your ilium. Here's your pelvis to your ilium area right in here, right along that joint line, or, or pelvis area, sorry. Uh, that area can get worse, especially, like I said, over a longer period of time. Think of it as another form of arthritis of your lower back. Can refer there. Alternative treatments, and I know people have a lot of questions on these. I know I could not cover that because I had to cover common things first and to leave time. But I want to emphasize a lot of these treatments up here have to do with muscle skeletal issues. Okay? Some have to do with some ligament issues, but when it comes to anatomical issues, they're not as effective. Now, acupuncture, I want to emphasize, is very good for muscle skeletal. Like on the like a quadratus lumborum strain, lower back strain. Biofeedback is to teach people how to actually manage their pain without having to take medicines as quickly. The Botox is actually very effective for some of the chronic pain conditions in the lower back that can be used to break them up. The Botox is also important because when I have someone that's now well controlled muscle skeletal pain with Botox for about three months, I can then do aggressive physical therapy and break up the pain pattern. That's the main reason for Botox. A TENS unit was postulated by some uh, famous people. I don't know what their specialty was. But Wolznack and Walls are the guys I remember their name from uh, my, my residency board. So I, can't, I had to know that name by heart. Anyway, it's a way of doing 
modulating electrical stimulation, like if you've ever been to physical therapy, they put these four pads in your lower back area where the pain is, and they change the frequency of the current. It's to break up the pain pattern. So that's a TENS unit. Neuroblation, that's something we do where it actually can kill the nerve. That's a type of called radio frequency type of uh, approach. We don't do that to prove that definitively the actual nerve generator is really bad. So a good example is the facet joint. We will not do neuroablation until we know we're very confident that's the actual joint itself. X-top procedure is an outpatient procedure generally. It's very effective for helping with spinal stenosis. I'll let Dr. Multani address that more. I want to emphasize something else. If you go into the jacuzzi, you go into a hot shower, and you've got back pain, guess what? You just made it worse. Feels good at the time. Fantastic. I feel great. But about a day or two later, Dr. Miller, my back pain's a lot worse, and I feel like I can't move. What you've really done is you caused a little bit of insert, increased circulation to the lower back. You have not shut off the nerve, area, nerve endings where the pain's being generated from, and you actually make the nerve endings worse. So by doing cold, it's more effective. Why cold? 30 minutes at a time. It shuts the nerve endings off three to four hours. Heat only shuts it off for 30 minutes to an hour. Cold is the best thing to do. So an example is if I have a back strain, I tell all my patients, go grab the ice pack, 30 minutes on, three times a day. Two, go get your pain medicines, either NSAIDs and then your muscle relaxant, and keep it up. Newer type of uh, medicines are now pain gels or pain patches. Those are very effective. And again, something you don't have to swallow or take. It's more direct, and it helps you. You don't have to worry about that. I want to emphasize yoga because that's flexibility. Flexibility is the number one key to prevent back pain, believe it or not. A lot of you here have tight hamstrings. If I stretched out your hamstrings, a lot of you would not have as much chronic deep achy pain in the morning when you woke up. Tai Chi, why is that important? Balance. You have to have balance to have good back muscles. Tai Chi is also a very good exercise to do. Um, I, I can't recommend enough. Chiropractic is last. Why? Because they're overdone. Um, and this is just me talking now. I have my own opinion. But I'll emphasize why. I was, I was trained back east and the approach with chiropractic it is very effective for the appropriate conditions. Out here on the west coast it's way overemphasized. Okay? You have to understand that. There are also complications for chiropractic that the chiropractor will not mention. I would respect if you like the chiropractor you go to now, but I will also argue you need to think about using them uh, judiciously because sometimes you get over too much treatment they actually can make your condition worse, especially if you have uh, lumbar spinal stenosis, things like that. Lastly, I want you to be a good golfer like me, good backs, okay? Um, and I want you to emphasize that by treating care of your back, you'll do very well going forward in the future. And I appreciate your time very much. Thank you. Today's presenter is Dr. Jenny Multani. Dr. Jenny Multani is a neurosurgeon. Dr. Multani received her medical degree from Christian Medical College and Hospital in India. She did her internship at Sinai Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, and her residency at West Virginia University Medical School in West Virginia. Dr. Multani conducted her fellowship in spine instrumentation at William Beaumont Hospital in Michigan and spine reconstruction at Wayne State University. Dr. Multani is on staff at the Washington Hospital Healthcare System. So back pain is the fifth most common reason to seek medical care. And this is across all age groups, okay? It's going to affect 90% of adults at some time in their life. And annual treatment exceeds $30 billion. The most recent figure is actually close to $50 billion. So it really is a very, very costly problem we have. So at any time, 20 to 30 percent of the general population, over 45 to 65, is at the greatest risk. 15 percent of all sick leave from work is due to back pain. Most common cause of disability in less than 45 years of age is back pain. So over a lifetime, 
there's a 60 to 90 percent chance we're going to have back pain. Every year, more and more people join the ranks, 5 percent. But guess what? Only 1 percent of patients have nerve root symptoms. Only 1 to 3 percent have a lumbar disc herniation. And some of the other diagnoses I'll address in a minute. But 85 percent of people, no specific diagnosis can be made. And there's a quote in 1952 which says, despite all the clinical examination, no pathology could be found in 85% of the people to account for their back pain. We are 50 plus years ahead with all our radiological techniques. With some help from EMGs, as Dr. Miller mentioned, we still in 85% of the time do not know what's the origin of the back pain. So it is very nonspecific. So the number of people in the United States over the next 25 years who are going to suffer from back pain is increasing by over 100%. I mean, that is enormous, which means everybody will have more than one area of their spine or the back hurting. Doubling of those over 50, 85 years. So about 70 million people out of the 380 million people suffer from back pain. 50% of this population will require basic nursing care and assistance with activities of daily living. So you can understand the enormity of this problem. Now, Dr. Miller mentioned some of these uh, uh, diagnoses, but for the aging spine, and some of you are not 19 years old anymore, uh, we have osteoporotic fractures, we have degenerative scoliosis, we have degenerative spondylolisthesis, which is the slip. And then, of course, you have mild trauma and falls, which lead to neck fractures. Less commonly, metastatic disease and osteomyelitis. So more common is the degenerative, but these are still factors we need to keep in mind. Now, in the aging spine, we have to be even more careful, because sometimes they do not respond in the typical fashion and they neither respond in the typical way to a disease process. They also have a lot of comorbidities. How, how many 80-year-olds do I see in my clinic who are not on any medication? The longest list of medications that I have put down in the, pa in the patient's chart is 25. That's a lot of medications because there are a lot of comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, this and that. And then, of course, the nutritional status isn't as good as we get older. So the goals of treatment in a 25-year-old coming to me after having had all non-operative treatment, including uh, Dr. Miller's expertise, is going to be different than somebody who's 75 years old and has done the non-operative -oper treatment. The goals are different. The 25-year-old wants to get better, go back to work, be able to run, be able to scuba dive, you know, do all kinds of sporting activities, et cetera, et cetera. The 65 or 75 year old says, doc, can I get 50% reduction in my pain? And can I be functionally able to still stay in my home and be reasonably comfortable in my activities of day-to-day -day living? Two different kinds of goals. So we have to be very cognizant of what we want to achieve. Now classically we want to cure, but as we're getting older our goals become different, they change. So what we need to first of all find, and just like uh, Dr. Miller had mentioned, we really need to make sure of those red flags. We want to make sure somebody does not have a tumor, primary or secondary. We want to make sure there's no infection, there's no fractures, or there's not a uh, neurologically threatening situation where you're losing control over your bowel and your bladder and you cannot walk. So those are things that are very, very important to recognize. Then, of course, is the classic sciatica. Everybody's getting very smart these days. They're on the internet and half the time I don't even have to say what people have got. They come and say, Doc, I think I have sciatica. Doesn't matter what they have. Doc, I have sciatica. And then, of course, you have non-specific back pain symptoms. 
and this could be just deep tooth aching type of a pain or it'll be tingling and numbness or it'll be descriptions that defy science and medicine. I've seen it all and heard it all. So we talked about this, the low back pain syndrome, generally speaking, you won't have your five-year-old come and say, my back's hurting. No, that doesn't usually happen. Now, if they do say that, that is serious because they normally won't complain about it, right? Ten-year-old, unless they've, you know, just finished their soccer game and they're saying, my, you know, my back's hurting. Again, it's got to be hurting pretty bad for ten-year-olds to complain. But if they do, you've got to pay attention. So some things, so generally people over 40 come and complain of back pain, although I've seen 19-year-olds with a herniated disc, skinny as anything. Um, part of the aging process, it can vary with each person. And we had, so, you know, initially thought, oh, if you're this weight, or if you're this ethnicity, or if you're that, you know, you have more likelihood of getting back pain. But like I said, I've seen very skinny people with back pain, and I've seen very big people with, you know, brain problems who have never had back pain. Yes, weight is a factor, but it's not the big factor. But certain things do accelerate the process. Vibration, repetitive bending and lifting, and uh, smoking, of course. Now, it's not in the slide, but I was again just very recently published article I was reading, and it was interesting to me that the highest incidence of back pain is actually in the Native Americans. So Native Americans, then blacks, then whites, then Hispanics, and the lowest incidence was in Asian, Asians. Now this was an epidemiological uh, study done by people visiting the emergency room. And it may be a cultural thing that you know certain groups do not go to the emergency room uh, with these symptoms as much as the others. Uh, but anyway, that was kind of the study. Then it was a look into whether men or women have more back pain. Somewhere between 25 and 40, the incidence of men was high, marginally so, about 3%, and women was less. But women 65 to 85 were you know more prone. Um, and why is that? I mean, you know, it's sort of, I know the gender gap is sort of closing up in every field of life, but probably again, men are more sort of into athletic activities or into what the insurance company would call high risk activities and maybe the incidence is different. So what are the me mechanisms of pain production? And I don't know Dr. Miller has touched upon uh, some and uh, we'll go over these very quickly. But some are direct compressive effects from the disc herniation and the bone spurs that we talked about earlier. But you can also have pain from vascular events. If, if you have insufficiency, you can still come with leg pain, but it's not from your spine. It's really from your peripheral vascular disease. Mechanical insufficiency. As the discs degenerate, they become more dehydrated and things are not as strong as before. And so you get inflammatory changes and then you have the muscles and also sometimes sympathetic pain occurs. So, you know, why I'm going over this history and physical exam and imaging and then we'll come to treatment because particularly the younger people, when I want to ask them certain questions, where does your back hurt? What kind of pain you have? Where does it radiate? You know what they say? Doc, haven't you looked at my MRI yet? <laughs> yes, I have, but that's not the story. The story is what you're telling me. The, di the distribution of the pain tells me, is it in your disc, is it muscle, is it, you know, for a short period of time, has been going on for years, and all these little bits of information are absolutely very important. And like emphasized in the previous talk, if you just fell yesterday and you're having excruciating pain, the assessment has to be different as opposed to say, I fell you know, eight, nine months ago, and I've had this pain, and it's just not gone away. Well, you may have a compression fracture which is partially healed, or you could have, from the fall yesterday, a compression fracture which is causing a lot of pain, and we need to address it. So the history, the narrative, the story is really, really very important. In fact, by the, t I, by the time the story is finished, I almost have an idea, is this pain coming from L45 level, which is one of the common 
sources or is it from the L5S1 level because it's going from the outside of the fort or is it going to the inside of the fort? And believe you me, people get very irritated when I'm asking these very detailed questions. Sometimes they get irritated because they just want, to, want me to quickly tell them what's wrong with them, you know. And the other times is because they actually haven't paid attention, which is like, okay. And I will, you know, say go back and sort of try and remember the next time you have a bad episode. And then, of course, uh, comes the physical exam. Sometimes people have a lot of back pain and there's nothing to find on the exam. There is no muscle weakness. I don't find any sensory loss. I raise their legs and they don't have a stretch sign like referred to by Dr. Miller, you know, straight leg raise tests or provocative tests as we say. I touch their spine, I don't get anything. So my exam is so-called negative or normal, okay, but there's lots and lots and lots in the story. And we'll come to that in a minute. So when that happens, now I go back. Earlier we had films, now we have discs. So now I go back and I start looking at the radiographic imaging and then come back and say, you know, this is what you have and the treatments that we're going to plan. So we went over some of uh, the uh, history that I want. And next time when you go to the doctor, I want you to try and remember how did it all start? What brought it on? Did you just wake up and have pain? Or did you lift something, you know, even five pounds or 10 pounds, grocery shopping, and that's when you started? Did you get numbness and tingling? Any weakness when you walk? You may be fine when you're lying in bed, but you know, some people will come and say, I'm okay when I'm sitting down, but when I start to walk, I could walk a block earlier, but now I can only walk half a block. Or earlier, I could do things in my house, but now I can barely make it to the bathroom and my legs feel weak or they go numb on me. And so in my mind, I'm saying, okay, is this stenosis? Now, a disc history will be, I feel worse when I sit. I'm okay when I lie down. So all these symptoms are very important to the physician. It doesn't matter whether you're seeing a surgeon or a physiatrist or your primary care doctor, these symptoms are very important. Walking difficulty, same thing. I'm okay to walk a few steps, but after that, either my legs go numb on me, or I just feel weak, then my knees are gonna give out, okay? Or your spouse might notice, then you, you walked pretty good a month ago, but now you're sort of waddling, you're you know, grabbing onto things. When things come on slowly, we don't notice that much. When things come dramatically, it sticks to the brain. But all this in the history is extremely important for the physician to decide, I need to send you to the ER now. I need to send you for an MRI scan tomorrow. This stuff can wait for two weeks, and I'll give you some medication to see if you feel better. So very important. Bladder and bowel. Very integral part of that control in the spine. So. In men particularly, you know, I say, okay, do you have any, any incontinence or any stress or anything like that, you know, and if it's an elderly male, I have to sort it out in my mind. Is it coming from a nerve problem or is it coming from a prostate problem? In women particularly who've had childbirth and stuff like that, it can be stress incontinence. So it's important, the history. You notice you pee a little bit when you laugh or you sneeze or you, you're peeing now, you know, and you got to, where's other stuff to be socially acceptable. So that's a change in your pattern. And it could be that you had stress incontinence first, but now it has changed. I need to know that because that gives me a sense of urgency. How quickly I need to send you for an assessment? How quickly do we need to move on? And then of course your medications. Some medications will, you know, for example, Lipitor, I don't know if you all remember, it was a little while ago when, you know, there was a big concern because people were taking Lipitor and having muscle weakness, okay? Now you have muscle weakness from medication, but who doesn't have a little back pain? So we need to sort all these things out and we need all that information. And the more information you give to your doctor, the more effective decision making can become. Now, we've gone over uh, this and I won't repeat, uh, but one just point, ankylosing spondylitis, which wasn't uh, you know, mentioned previously, 
Anybody with early morning stiffness, pain over three months, not relieved lying down, and usually less than 40, that's one of the diagnoses to also have at the back of your mind. And then, like I said, we examine and we kind of want to know where, which muscles are weak, which areas you do not have appropriate sensation, and what your reflexes are doing. Provocative tests, all these point into the right direction. Now, everything that hurts does not always come from the back. But back is a very general area. Back is a very general area. And Dr. Miller has addressed some of the neck and shoulder related problems. But kidney disease can come as back pain, right? We talked about vascular. Hip problems can be pain going towards the middle of the back and pain going down the leg. So we need to be aware of all these. And I won't go into the details of the exam. We address that. Another factor that comes into play, and this is more in the younger population. If you're drip, depressed or anxious, everything will get exacerbated, including your back pain. I once actually had a lady where we uh, had put in a pump and you know she was all set, and two weeks later she calls and she says, my pain is more. And then I called her in and I, didn't ask her why her pain was more. I just asked her a simple question. I said, are you getting divorced? And she was blown away. She said, Doc, how did you know? I said, no, your pain is worse. Something has happened in your life, something different. So depression, anxiety actually can increase or exacerbate your symptoms. Now, very interesting, I think it was in, a, in the paper or on the internet, you know, you get so confused these days trying to read these things where you read it. But there was a remark saying, married people do well after spine surgery. Okay, so I said, they should have rephrased it. People who have good support do well after spine surgery. People who do not have any support don't do well. It doesn't matter spine surgery or anything else. So psychosocial factors do uh, play a part in our overall well-being. Then of course we have the work-related injuries. Dr. Miller and I see a fair few of these and uh, he will bear me out that you know a lot of times we've done the history, we've done the exam, we've done the radiology and we don't find anything to put our finger on that's causing the pain because everything comes out normal except for the history that they were injured at work. And so then becomes a very difficult task to one say the work event caused it and is it propagating it or the person doesn't want to go to work or person doesn't like his boss and rather have the time off and you know dwell on other things in life and you know watch some TV or whatever and of course the compensation litigation issues uh, make a big difference. And Interestingly enough, so these, these are very important questions that uh, we always uh, ask our patients. And uh, you know, if you're asking about you know, personal questions, it's again to come to the right conclusions. Now, I always look at this. If you come to me with back pain, and yes, I am a surgeon, but I'm a physician first. I want, for you, it's real at that point in time. So it's my job to sort out what is really pathological that needs urgent attention and what needs to be treated by somebody else non-surgically, be it a psychiatrist, be it a physiatrist, be it somebody. Because the worst thing would be to operate on somebody who didn't need an operation because you didn't fix anything. So it's also my job to figure out what factors are playing into somebody's symptomatology. Very, very critical. We, you know, in the era of technology are becoming more and more occupied uh, with that kind of stuff and uh, becoming less and less focused on the narrative. Uh, and uh, so I think as physicians, we need to be very cognitive of that because all these factors affect. So when do I kind of think, you know, that things aren't quite kosher, like I talked about, you know, when you have an exam that doesn't fit into an anatomical sort of location. I mean, I had a patient who 
I operate on the neck and comes and tells me, you know, he's got something going on the ear, something is going on in his eyes and something is going on elsewhere. Well, it doesn't fit any anatomical location. So I know that something else is going on. Again, you know, as uh, pointed out earlier in the earlier talk, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a very difficult condition. Earlier, we used to think it was all women and hyster hysteria, but now we know it's a central pain syndrome, it's real. But again, it's my job to find out, you know, is it a treatable problem from my aspect or it's something that needs to be referred, let's say, to a rheumatologist. Uh, to be further evaluated. So there are lots of these things that, uh, you know, are very, very critical in our history and our exam. And uh, we talked about some red flags earlier, and I try to remember it as the FIT principle. If you don't have a fracture, you don't have infection, you don't have a tumor, then we are good. We're going to live long, and we'll fix as best as we can some of the other things. So this is what a fracture uh, looks like. And this is particularly so uh, when, uh, as we get older, we get osteopenic and it's an osteoporotic uh, fracture. This is enough to cause pain. Why does it cause pain? Loss of height is causing a compression effect and it'll cause pain which is sort of more localized. Now if you fell yesterday and I'm seeing you today in the emergency room or in the hospital, you probably will have a, a area where when I touch, you say, Oh, that hurt a lot. Don't touch me there again. So <clears throat> we have to be aware of it. Now, this is what uh, an infection will look like. This area right here where the arrows are, you find that that doesn't look quite as normal as the area above and below. And so there's a loss of the disk space. The color looks different. And in the MRI sequences, we kind of uh, can do different things and find out that that looks like an infection. Now, that's an emergency. We need to treat that very quickly. So that's a big red flag. And something like a spine tumor will look like this, a big little blob sitting there. OK, now we need to make sure that the FIT principle is there. No fractures, no infections, no tumors. So an MRI will give us answers to some of the, uh, these kinds of conditions. So now we come to the most common conditions that we find, which we've talked about, just alluded to a little bit earlier, is the degenerative conditions. As we get older, we are aging. I sometimes think that I don't know what's a better alternative, but degenerative sounds kind of negative. I don't know if anybody in the audience has a, has a better name for it. Uh, because as I'm getting older, I don't want to feel I'm degenerating. But you know, <laughs> but that's kind of uh, yeah, <clears throat> what we are commonly seeing. And you're now all familiar with this anatomy, so I'm going to skip it. A disc is like a donut, as we describe it, the outer crust and then the jelly in between. And it's the jelly in between that will extrude out. And that's the nucleus pulposus. And this has already been. <clears throat> alluded to by Dr. Miller. And he's very eloquently gone over uh, the uh, disc herniation. As you can see, some of the material in the bottom slide C is starting to leak out. And as we degenerate, he and I, I guess, shared the same slide from the same book. Uh, you know, the disc spaces collapse, and this is what it'll look like on an x-ray. I'm trying to find the arrow here, but the narrow area is where the uh, loss of disc height is. Now, if we x-rayed everybody in this room, myself and some of the very young people monitoring uh, you know, the video stuff, John there, we all will have some amount of degeneration, some amount of loss of height. But not all of us have pain. So a radiographic abnormality with the history and exam will point to the right direction, but a radiographic abnormality alone is not enough to require treatment, particularly surgical treatment. And this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem uh, with people getting their MRI scans, pulling it up at home before they go see the doctor, and they've already done a research on everything that uh, possibly can be done, and then they come and come to you 
and you say, no, 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 I'd like to actually do some physical therapy first and say, well, you know, but I have a whole list of things that can be done. No, we don't want to do that, okay? So um, as we talked about spinal stenosis, again, you can see the difference at the bottom is a nice judicious canal, and at these particular areas, it's pretty narrow. We almost call it like a rat's tail. And this is a condition radiographically that correlates to the woman who's leaning over the cart. And that's again in the history I ask a lot of people, almost every patient, do you want to grab the cart as soon as you walk into the grocery store? And if they say yes, you kind of know that it's probably an element of spinal stenosis. And why do we do that? Because as you bend over, you've, you're trying to create a little more space and relieve pressure on those nerve roots. And this is a slip that we talked about. So the x-ray shows one bone above the other. And again, this results in narrowing the nerve roots. And it's in the lowest uh, you know, part of the spine most commonly, L5S1. And occasionally, people are born with it. But majority of the times, it's as we get older, so majority of the time, it's degenerative. So in, if in the history and physical, we don't see those red flags, then we need to do all the diagnostic testing only if symptoms don't resolve in a month. So we do the x-rays, we do the MRI scan, we do the myelogram, and some of you may in your lifetime have had a discography, and some of you may not have had it, but the hardest, hardest diagnosis is discogenic pain. Without radicular pain, without pain going down the leg, when all you have is pain in the back, and you don't have stenosis, you don't have spondylolisthesis, the slip, and you don't have, of course, any of the other things I mentioned in the FIT principle, no fractures, infections, or tumors, and people are still saying, my back hurts, my back hurts. And when you look at the MRI scan, it looks pretty normal. And so you now have to decide whether this is coming from the discs. Now when, you know, there's loss of height and all these changes have occurred, it's a little easier. So we used to do discography to determine if that was the cause of the pain. Now, as you can see, we have a normal MRI scan. This is what it should all look like beautifully on the left-hand side. Nice juicy discs. They look white. Why? Because they've got lots of water content in them. And as we get older, you look on the right-hand side, you've got two things happening there. Three things, in fact, happening on this MRI scan. You have the bulges, as pointed out earlier. You have the discs that don't look so white, particularly at the lowest two levels, the 4-5 and the 5-1. And you've got some white at the bones. And those are called modic changes. And again, they all point that this is a degenerative process. Okay, And in addition to the degenerative process, there are disc bulges at these two levels. So when, and I'm hoping that whoever you see, particularly before any surgery, that you get shown your MRI scans and you can actually see what abnormality is on the MRI scan before you make any surgical decisions. Now some of you may have pacemakers, and so we cannot do an MRI scan. And in that instance, we inject dye in the back and we do a myelogram. And as the arrow points out, it's very narrow there. So that kind of tells us what the problem is. And this is an example of actually putting little contrast in the disc, increasing the pressure in the disc, similar to the concept in the earlier talk about when you have a bowel movement or you sneeze or you cough and the pressure goes up. What we're looking for is the patient saying, aha, I got pain shooting down my leg when I injected a certain area. And then I'm asking, okay, was it the outside, inside? So we are looking for what is called concordant pain because God designed us very beautifully. At each level, nerves come out and go to certain parts of the leg and certain parts of the foot. So at L4-5, pain goes down more towards the inside of the foot. L5-S1, pain goes more to the outside of the foot. 
So if all that is happening, then we say, yes, even though your MRI didn't really quite show it, you have a reason for your pain. And if we did something about it, we hope that you will be better. So some of these uh, tests, that's what they're used for. And I won't belabor, Dr. Miller has already talked about the EMG. But I will reiterate one more time that before we go into any operative mode, which I will in a minute, I want to go and try a gamut of non-operative. I again kind of don't like the word conservative. Not that I'm a Democrat, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, we want to put it as a non-operative treatment and as an operative treatment, okay? So when you first have back pain, bed rest for two, three days is enough. Bed rest for a week is a very, very, very bad idea. Because if you put a normal person to bed for a week, they will lose 50% of their strength. So bed rest for two, three days is okay, but longer than that is not okay. Then of course, all the stuff that has been mentioned, the anti-inflammatory drugs, the analgesics for acute exacerbation, and, uh, and that can be narcotic analgesics if necessary, muscle relaxants, sometimes antidepressants help. For a very short spell, particularly in people who have a slip, we, we can try the orthosis. You wear a corset or a belt and you feel better. Diet and exercise. Cannot emphasize enough of that. So we'll skip some of this because it's already been uh, mentioned. Again, spinal manipulation treatment, helpful for acute low back pain without radiculopathy. This is all the physiatrist realm, and if there are any questions, uh, we'll address them. And modalities have been mentioned. And very, very true, ice is much better than heat. As a personal kind of a thing, I climbed 12,000 feet, and there was this lake where you're part of the religious thing, take a dip, it was freezing cold. I was shivering, but I had no pain. So most people want to automatically go towards heat because it's more comforting but it's ice that is more helpful. And again, I will not go into all these uh, except I did. Now, people come and they talk about the intradiscal electrothermal coagulation, or sometimes even people say about you know, laser surgery. Are you not going to do my disc with laser? The whole concept is to burn some of the disc to decrease the pressure and relieve the pain. The people who actually started IDET were a set of two brothers. And I cannot remember if both of them were physiatrists or one of them was a surgeon and the other one was a physiatrist. And the best results were from them because the, after this procedure, they had extensive physical therapy for six months. It has not been reproduced to the same extent. So at the end of the day, it was really the management by the physiatrist rather than the procedure. And so this has always been very controversial. And in, in the distant past, we used to use chemicals called chymopapain. And again, it had uh, some benefit, but not a whole lot. So there are different ways to build the cat, whether you put laser and burn the disc, where you put an injection and do it by heat, you know, or you put a chemical and you decrease the volume, it all is about the same, and all of this has the same 37 to 44% result in the short term. Now, we've done all that, and sometimes I have patients that I see at the outset, soon after the primary care has seen, and then I send them to physical therapist and, you know, uh, Dr. Miller's evaluation, et cetera, and then people, you know, ask about chiropractic, and that's already been addressed, if you know a good one. Uh, for two, three treatments is fine. Uh, if you have a neck problem, I sincerely say stay away from manipulation because we've actually in my residency had somebody who became quadriplegic after manipulation. Uh, and I'm not saying that everybody is the same, but the risk is very high. Lower back, uh, probably less of a risk, but limited. And I, I actually am seeing a woman who as a chiropractor has been treating her once a month for the past one year. And I finally had to tell her, I cannot imagine a treatment that is going on for a year, once a month, and making you feel better. So it's different. 
So what are my goals? When you come to me and you say, I've done this and I've done that and I've done that and I've done that and I'm not feeling better. So then we start looking at what's wrong with you, but what are the goals? You've got pain coming from two broad categories. You've got nerve pain and you've got bone pain. Is your nerve pain 90% and your bone pain 10% or 50-50? Because the decisions will be made based on that. Now, do you have stability or instability? And that's going to drive what kind of procedure we're going to do. Now, do you have deformity or you do not have deformity? And in deformity, as we get older, a lot of times we see degenerative scoliosis. You know, the curve in the spine has been altered. So my goal is to take pressure off the nerves and save what you have and hopefully get some of what you've lost back. And I cannot emphasize this enough. And I take great, uh, you know, peeve when somebody comes to me and says, I went to so-and-so, I'm here for a second opinion, but so-and-so said, your back pain is going to be cured. You know, and I tell them, once you have back pain, it's like diabetes or hypertension, you can control it, you cannot cure it. Because it's a process that's been set in motion. And except if you have a tumor. The tumor, you know, your risks are generally up front. You remove the tumor, you're better or worse or the same, apart from that. So take the pressure of the nerves, make your spine stable if it's unstable, and correct the deformity, which is again basically saying that your spine is unstable. And so there are different things that we do. So the red, most people can see a little bit of the red. That's when you have the disc herniation. The nerves are coming out. This red is pressing on this nerve, which is a disc. So if that's all the MRI shows, I'm doing something very, very simple. And it's called a discectomy. What is my goal? My goal is not to take out the entire cushion, which is in between your two bones, but only take out that which is out and pressing on the nerve. And by taking the pressure of the nerve, I'm allowing that nerve to heal. And as much as the nerve heals, the pain will be better. And that's the unpredictable part of it. Because despite all our technology, nobody can predict how long will it take to get better. Okay? Now muscle weakness, there are times when you operate and within a week or so, you start noticing that the muscles come back. It's coming back in strength. The sensation will vary. Sometimes you'll have patch of numbness that will go on for six weeks to six months and up to a year. But usually I tell everybody, you've reached maximal improvement by a year after the surgery. Okay. Now, I have patients, particularly the younger ones, if they are treated quickly, Within six weeks of a huge disc herniation, they get better much faster. The chronicity doesn't come in, and I will come to that towards the end. And you know, they go back to work faster. The longer this all stays, the harder it is for things to get as much better as one would like. Okay, and then of course we come down to the lumbar stenosis that we talked about. That's when things are narrow from where these Nerves are coming out, the foramina that Dr. Miller talked about, okay? Now, there are several things we can do. We can take a little piece of device, put it in between, called the X-stop. What will it do? Same mechanism that you're trying to do when you're leaning on the cart. But now we've put a device which is going to, watch this, open it up, okay? So that next stop basically really is a device between the two spinous processes to make the holes bigger. You make the holes bigger, you take the pressure off the nerves, and you start feeling better. If that doesn't work, and that may temporarily work, you may have good relief for six months to a year. It's still OK as a consideration. Why? Because it's a least destructive procedure. You basically separate the muscles, you go put this in, you come back, you've not destroyed any bone, okay? But sometimes the process is going on, things are getting more and more narrow, the joints are getting more and more hypertrophied because when one part is weak, 
the body is trying to throw in more support by making the ligaments thicker, by making the joints a little bigger, same kind of knuckling you have when you have joint problems, same thing happens in the spine. But there's no room for the nerves to go anywhere. So in this much of space, if you start putting bigger and bigger things, the little things are going to get squished out, right? So then we do what is called a decompressive laminectomy. So we remove the back part of the bone, try and give more room for the nerves. And I tell everybody, when we are operating, the skin is the entry into the bank, right? The bone is entry into the vault. And in the vault, that door is your jewelry. And guess what? The jewelry is the most important thing, right? Or your documents or whatever have you. So we don't want to make the vault door too big. So we're trying to basically because people come today and you know there will always be ads and somebody operated through this little incision and somebody operated through this little incision. You have to make the incision enough to do the job for you to get to the vault. Okay, So that's the decompressive laminectomy where we take part of the bone at the back off. Now, while we're doing the laminectomy, taking the lamin off, we also want to make the holes bigger. That's after all the goal to take the pressure of the nerves and that's called a foraminotomy. Now the next step when you have in combination things are narrow and then there are slips we go to what's called a spinal fusion. Okay and I have the models for what looks like a spinal fusion uh, and you, you're all very welcome to look at it. Now you've done all this and still there is pain. Okay. Pain may be better, but it's not all gone away, or you know, it's not gone away enough. And so there are procedures where you can do pain control. <coughs> Excuse me. Particularly in cancer patients, what is our goal? Our goal is uh, you know a short-term relief of pain. So there are things that we can implant called the pain pumps, and there's a narcotic medication put into the pain pumps, which gives person comfort and relief. Okay, and then for pain control, you also have spinal cord stimulators. So the different things that we can do. So now we are doing all these things a little better than what we did before. And these are what we call the minimally invasive techniques. Okay, and there is a model that I'll show you where we can actually now go from the side, except for the very lowest level, L5S1, we can go from the side and through these small incisions to actually big fusions. Blood loss is only like 25, 50 cc's. Okay, and then we turn you over and we actually put the screws in, again percutaneously under x-ray guidance, the incisions are this small where the screws go. Okay, so lots of stuff now can be done through much smaller incisions, less muscle disruption, less blood loss, shorter hospital stays, you need less pain medication. Okay, so that's what uh, you know we kind of want to do what is safe what is more effective do, does the same job with less side effects and we've talked about this so in terms of spinal fusions again like i said offer it only one if you fail everything and there is evidence of instability or sometimes people will come back and say and we have patients where, you know, they had a herniated disc five years ago, then they came back again four years later with another herniated disc, and now they've come back again with a third herniation. And at that point, you're kind of saying, how long is this going to go on? Maybe we need to take away that disc because that disc is already showing propensity for repeated recurrent herniations, so we will offer a spine fusion. And this is what something on x-ray will look like with the screws in. And on the model, as you can see, there's two rods which are going in between and there's a transverse connector. There are always risks to anything we do. There's always a downside to anything we do. The upside is, you know, we relieve your symptoms significantly. Okay, and when I talk about significantly, it's a little bit different than, uh, you know, having some other surgeries done. Now, you know, when, when you have an appendix removed 
and if it's gone without any problems, that's 100%, that's cured. I mean, you don't have another appendix that needs to come out, right? But, or gallbladder for that matter. But in spine surgery, you operate at one level, you are putting the adjacent levels at risk, or the adjacent levels are already diseased, but they're not diseased enough. And that level may go one as we get older, or that level gets put under higher stress because now you fused one level. So anything above and below, you're adding the risk of an adjacent level problem, okay? And when you go to the doctor, they should be talking about what are your risks for adjacent level disease? And it's about 20%. So 20% chances that in the next, next decade, that level may need to be addressed, okay? And then of course, now we've got more and more and more sophisticated bone making materials, but earlier we used to use your own bone, and that was an issue. Sometimes the spine part is okay, but now you've got pain where you donated your bone from. So graft donor site pain uh, is important. Now if we are putting screws where in, into the bodies, they're going very close to where the holes from where the nerves come out. So there's a chance that a nerve could be injured. We have monitoring techniques. We try and put as much safety elements into our surgeries as possible, but it's nevertheless a risk. Now, many of you may have even heard of total disc, disc replacement, okay, TDRs as we call them. They are, a lot of patients will come and say, can I get my disc replaced instead of having a spine fusion? Sure you can, but you may or may not be the right candidate. And usually the best candidate for a total disc replacement is, um, unfortunately it's an age discrimination by nature, but the best people are the ones who are the younger side of 40 who've just had a sports injury, it's just one disc level and the rest of the spine looks healthy. They've not had any joint problems, they've not had any ligamentous hypertrophy, so it's just one level disease and everything else looks healthy. They are the perfect candidates. And why we want to do that, if the insurance companies would approve, uh, is because we do not want to put them into that situation of adjacent level disease by fusing the spine. You do reduce flexibility when you fuse the spine, and that is depending on how many levels we fuse. So that's uh, the role of the disc replacement. But it is a very uphill and challenging task to get the insurance companies to approve it because it costs a little more. And we talked about the pumps and the stimulators, but for somebody who's got chronic pain and everything else has failed, then we have what are called deep brain stimulators, where we put a little electrode in a certain area of the brain which modulates our brain. So what is happening is that your brain is perceiving the pain differently and it's perceiving the pain less. But before one goes to into this very deep thing, again, you know, just because back pain is such a common problem, of course, there's all kinds of cures in the newspapers, the internet, as well as the scientific literature. So they did a study about in, uh, in Stanford about volunteers. Took, of course, the poor medical students who can't say no, and put them in the functional MRI scan, and they gave half of them no knowledge that they were going to get a pain stimulus and gave them a pain stimulus. And they looked at the number of centers that were activated in the brain. And then there was other group where they kind of started telling them about a few minutes ahead of time, you're going to get a pain stimulus, you're going to get a pain stimulus, you're going to get a pain stimulus. And then they gave the pain stimulus and saw how many centers were activated. And so the second group had more centers activated because you already, your brain has started programming that you're going to get pain, you're going to get pain, you're going to get pain. So now, it was a very interesting paper which said, the less you talk about pain, the less pain you will have. Of course, easier said than done when you're in a lot of pain, but basically it was, as soon as people have a treatable problem and that problem gets treated early enough, they were the people who had the best results. So the longer you go on with your pain syndrome, 
the harder it becomes to make it better. So, you know, with this big, big magnitude of problem, we are always looking ahead saying, can we get something that will repair the disc? Can we get something like stem cells, which is again, you know, the answer to everybody's prayer, but it hasn't come through yet, is stem cells. And then, like I said, alteration of centers in the brain for perception of pain. So at the end of the day, as a surgeon, I always look at any surgical outcome is the result of correct surgical indications. Underline, underline, underline. Correct surgical indications, patient preparation, and of course, surgical technique. The immediate post-op care by the nursing staff, the physical therapist, the social workers, the dietitian, and of course now the support that you may have is going to go a long way to make you better. Thank you. And then the other thing, does golf make your back worse? It's a great question. As far as golf or any activity involving the lower back, and I'm a golfer, so I tend to know a little more about the back pain and issues with, th with that. It really has to do with your technique. I find a lot of golfers overuse their back incorrectly when they should be turning their hip. And that's why they get injured with their lower back and they're straining, especially that muscle I talked about, the quadratus lumborum. So it's really, you, you have to learn how to do a proper mechanics for the lower back pain itself, I mean for the uh, golf swing itself. Yeah, uh, you mentioned about the machine DX9000. Besides, it's, you said it's costly, but uh, if my, my chiropractor offer me the plan and like uh, for 20 treatment and my insurance, my insurance will cover, so I just pay around $400. You think this is worth it to try? You're talking about the DX9000, the lumbar traction device? No, I would not recommend it. Even if the insurance covers it, I still would not recommend it. What, what the dangerous to do that? Because, well, one, it doesn't work. Two, there's a risk of causing a subluxation of your femur. Three, they can actually make your hip worse, theoretically. And there are other issues you can, you can have injured. Like, for example, part of that is they, I think they lock in your shoulder. And I've heard about shoulder subluxations. It, it, you know, personally, I do not recommend using that machine. I actually had a patient who paid $5,000 for, I think, uh, some 10 treatments, pain-free for 20 days. All the pain came back, went back to them, and said, you told me I'd be better. And they said, you know, you were better for 20 days. And that was $5,000 down the drain. And I just, uh, you know, I was, I know being facetious, as if I had bought dresses for $5,000, I'd felt a whole bunch better. You know, so <laughs> there's lots of marketing out there, particularly for this condition, which is so common, affects most of us. And, you know, why there are so many treatments? Because there is no real good answer. You know, some of the Conditions are very clear and defined, and so it's okay. But like I said, 85% of the time, there's no good answer. So you could try this herb or this tea or that gel. It'll all work for a while, and then it won't work. And, you know, I, uh, if you do not have a nerve-threatening condition, believe me, moving, exercising, flexibility really is the answer. It truly is the answer. I've got a personal trainer for the last five sessions, and it was like burning. But after that, I'm feeling better. It's amazing that, you know, I said, no, no, come on, come on, come on. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Because I want to stop, and I want to do this. I said, can't do it. But, you know, pushing past that burning, pushing past that pain, but it makes you feel better. As long as you know there's no significant compression and somebody is monitoring how you're doing it, and this is where I send my patients to Dr. Miller and you know his class of physicians, is they can then supervise that you do it correctly. You don't have to go to him 20 times, but you need to go initially a few times to learn correctly how to do it. And 
movement is the key. Movement is really the key. And you know, just because you're hurting, you feel you can't exercise or you can't do this, simple movements are enough. Start doing them. You said that uh, you didn't recommend having going to a chiropractor for neck. What about for upper back? We're talking about the thoracic level, which is between the neck and the lower back. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Between the shoulder blades, that area. Hmm. If they're focusing on just doing myofascial and a couple of manipulations, that should be okay, providing there's no really risk. But my issue is that if you have four to six sessions and you're not at least 50% decrease in pain 30 days after the chiropractic session is ended, you just, it's not gonna work. I find I probably about once a year I do something that gets my back unhappy and I go and have one treatment and then I'm fine again for about another year. So right. Is and that okay? That's okay, but I would come back and say to you, most likely it's a, a deep muscle spasm and they just cause it to release a little I using see. the chiropractic technique. Versus if I taught you stretching, you could do it on your own at home. Another way to look at it. You talked about the cervical <coughs> and the lower back. Sometimes you get pain in the mid-back. What is that? Go ahead. A lot of times the pain in the thoracic spine actually is very common. It's coming from the facets, which are the joints. And um, again, you know, as long as uh, it's, it's just fleeting, comes and goes, I'm, I'm not too worried about it. If it stays over a week or two weeks, then I would like to get an MRI done, particularly when you know we are all past uh, 40, we can have other conditions um, that can uh, you know come to the spine, particularly cancers. You wanna make sure that there is no metastases to the spine before you do anything. Uh, but most, most common cause is really from the facets. And if you don't have any sort of red flags, then again, strengthening is the key. Strengthening and posture. Yeah, normally it's when you move, you get the pain. When you're still, there's no pain. Right. That's not uncommon with a facet problem. Uh, yes, I have problems with uh, L4 and L5, and the doctor told me that the, it was narrowing so the nerves were not going down properly. What do they do for that? Well, that's, uh, you know, if you've tried all the non-operative treatment, that's when we kind of get an MRI scan and uh, see how bad the pinch is and uh, what is the progression of your symptoms. And if you're continuing to progress, then, uh, you know, without looking at your images, I can't really tell you, you in particular, but generally speaking, the options are foraminotomy or a laminectomy to open up the nerves. Now, if you have instability, then we may need to do more than that. But if there is no instability, that would be enough. All right. Uh, there are different kinds of shoes now for different types of activities, you know, walking shoes, cross trainers, and that kind of stuff. They have come out with something called MBT or Skechers has, has it. They're kind of a curved sole that's supposed to be designed to mimic a Maasai warrior walking in the sand. What do you think about those types of products? Oh, yeah, awesome. Well, all I know is that there's a trend right now in running, for example, where they want you to run barefoot, or they want you to with those shoes with have just little fingers at the end of it or toe areas. And it's very minimal contact. But the problem is, is that your foot naturally will do what's called land on its heel and then eccentrically let you bring the foot down using your front muscle, your leg, and then come down and push off using your calf muscle. And that's the normal mechanics of how a foot operates, okay? The problem is what you're describing is, it, is the shoe is now taking over some of that work of the anterior tibialis muscle. And the problem is over time, it actually may lead to bad biomechanics of how your foot lands. And now this is called the kinetic chain, where if the foot doesn't land properly, that's gonna affect the knee. If the knee doesn't affect, do its normal motion, that affects the hip. And if the hip doesn't work properly relative to what it should, it's gonna affect the lower back. In the long run, we find with those kind of shoe innovations, a lot of them are get discontinued because the actual shoe wound up lower back pain. A good example of similar to the shoe that you're talking about came out from the Nike shoes back with the gel technology in the late 70s, early 80s when I was running a lot myself, and I actually got lower back pain. I had to get rid of the shoe. And at the time, it was a $100 shoe, not cheap. So I would say stay away from it until you see someone else saying, I have cured my back pain by running with those shoes. 
Again, common sense, it's marketing gimmick is what I'm trying to say.